Welcome to this new series of the Massey Dialogues. My name is Natalie DeRosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is located on indigenous land, the land of the Seneca, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and for the ability that we have to continue our work here. The Massey Dialogues are based on the idea of bringing together the voices of experts and the voices of the young researchers. This intergenerational aspect is key to the vision. We want to discuss issues of the day and hear different perspectives. I want to thank the Massey community for the wealth of good suggestions that we have received throughout the summer, and particularly to Keshna Sud and Michael Valpi for, and their committee for putting together this fall program. Enjoy today's discussion. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Michael Valpi. I am a senior fellow at Massey and I'll be hosting what is the last planned Massey Dialogue of the year, a rather different Massey Dialogue and of a very different kind of year. I don't think Principal De Rossier anticipated that we'd end 2020 with a conversation about how garter snakes make friends. But that's one of the things that's so wonderful about this place, the intellectual curiosity of its members leads it everywhere and, and anywhere. Um, this past fall, some of the leading names in science publications, uh, Science Magazine, National Geographic, Smith, Smithsonian Magazine, got into a noisy buzz over a scholarly paper written by Massey alumnus Noam Miller, an associate professor of collective animal cognitive behavior at Wilfrid Laurier University and one of his graduate students, uh, PhD candidate Morgan Skinner, over their experiments with the social behavior of garter snakes. Garter snakes. Snakes, as Noam will tell us in a moment, are hard to study because they're secretive and they hide. But what he and Morgan Skinner discovered in Noam's lab at Wilfrid Laurier is that they're not solitary, they're social, they make friends, some other garter snakes they like and some they don't like, and why they prefer some snakes but not others isn't exactly known, but for a fact, that's what happens. And we've got two members of the college community to question Gnome and to enlighten us about what they're doing and why the snakes. Uh, Massey alumna uh, Rosie Martin, Rosemary Martin, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at U of T, where she also did her undergraduate. And looking for an excuse to do field work all year round, she says, she decided to focus her thesis on the effects of under ice conditions on the behavior and survival of aquatic insects, which, as she points out, turns out to be a subject about which relatively little is known because few people do winter field work. I should also add that um, Massey members over the past few years became used to seeing Rosie wading in her hip boots in the Massey pond, discovering the secret secrets of who calls it home. Senior fellow, Dr. Joel Levine is professor and chair of the Department of Biology at University of Toronto. He grew up in Philadelphia, got his bachelor's at the University of Pennsylvania, and became interested in the circadian, circadian rhythms, the sleep and awake cycles of rats, and received his PhD in the Department of Anatomy and Structural Biology. He then became interested in the genetics of the Drosophila fruit fly, did postdocs at Harvard and Brandeis, and came to U of T in 2003. 
as Gnome studies the social networks of snakes, Joel studies the social networks and biological clocks of flies. Which brings us to Gnome. Um, while he was a junior fellow at Massey, he uh, introduced me to his academic interests by telling me how, and he's smiling, by telling me how pigeons can be superstitious, which I repeated to the King of Sweden, who was visiting Massey at the time. Hello, your majesty. I'd like to introduce you to Noam Miller, who's interested in superstition, superstition in pigeons. And the king looked at Noam with a kind of blank, stunned look and moved on. Uh, Noam was awarded his doctorate at U of T. He then did a postdoc in the ecology and evolutionary biology department of Princeton. And since 2014 has been a member of the psychology and biology departments at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. His research spans the range from uh, comparative animal cognition to behavioral ecology, but his primary interest is how group behavior shapes individual cognitive functions such as learning and decision making. He studies collective cognition in a range of animals from fish and snakes to rats and humans from quails to, of course, pigeons. Uh, known for the 10 years or more that I've known you, I've always wanted to introduce you and tell the audience about your interest in superstitious pigeons without you interrupting me. And I finally got my wish. You haven't told me to be quiet while I've gone through the, the narrative. So, I'd like to start by, uh, by you telling our audience uh, what got you interested in studying how garter snakes make friends and how you went about doing it. And after you set the stage, uh, I'm going to ask our IT guru, Matt Glanfield, to play a short video of garter snakes looking for pals in your lab. And you can tell us what they're doing. So let's talk for about 15 minutes or so. Tell us what got you interested in you in this. Why snakes? What did you know about the behavior of garter snakes? So you take up the narrative and go. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. Um, thank you yeah, thank very you. much for, very much for um, inviting me to do fine. this. Um, I'm very excited to be part of the college again, uh, however remotely. Um, and so what got me interested in social behavior in snakes? Um, so I've been studying social behavior for much of the, I'm sorry to say, closer to 20 years that Michael and I have known each other. Um, and um, what I think is interesting is that social behavior is different in different species. And the kinds of structures, uh, the kinds of social structures that different species have um, when we look at them, when we compare them to each other, can tell us a lot about the kind of basic rules of forming social aggregations. And snakes are very understudied in general, partly because, as Michael said in his introduction, they're often hard to find, their behavior tends to be hidden under rocks, uh, and so we don't know very much about them. We don't know very much about their behavior, we don't know very much about their ecology, and so we wanted to see whether their social behaviors were somehow different from other species in an interesting way that would help us broaden our picture of social structures generally. Um, the other reason that this is very interesting is that there's a preconception in a lot of the literature that snakes are just not social. Um, that they, they do their own thing on their own, they get together obviously to mate, um, and every now and then to maybe hibernate together. But by and large, beyond that, the, the uh, preconception was that they don't socialize. Uh, and so we wanted to actually test whether or not this was true. And, and as it turns out, it's not. So Matt, can I interrupt you, Gnome, at this point? Matt, can you play sure. the video 
of snakes and gnomes laboratory. Okay, so I can I can walk you through what you're going to see here. So me, I'd appreciate it. Um, so the the basic uh, the experiment that we do is actually very simple. We have this kind of square arena uh, with four shelters in it. Those are those black rectangles, and we put ten snakes in there, and we just watch them. Uh, this is a greatly sped up video, uh, and what we do is we take a picture of this arena every five seconds for the entire 12 hours of daylight every day for eight days. And the snakes just live in here. And um, you can't see it because it's, it's uh, too small, but each of these snakes is marked on its head with a couple of dots of uh, this special non-toxic nail polish in different colors so that we can tell them apart. And what we get from this is that we can tell, we can follow them around, as you can see, and we can tell at any given moment where any snake, where all the snakes are. Uh, and what that allows us to do is figure out their social networks, as in who spends time with whom. Are they kind of are there a number of snakes outside moving around together, or are they sheltering in the same shelter together with other individuals? Um, and so we did this. Sorry. No, go ahead. Just finish. Um, so we, we did this, I was just going to say, we did this four times with four different groups of snakes. Um, so, so we have some replications of it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the, the kind of raw data that we were working with. Uh, I should okay. also point out that, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to point out one final thing before we go, yeah. Michael. I didn't interrupt you before, so I get to now. Um, that even though in the video you saw the snakes moving around a lot, that was a kind of cherry picked section of the experiment. The snakes spend the vast majority of their time just sitting in the shelters. About 94, 95% of the time, they're just sitting in the shelters. Okay, this kind of uh, sets up my, my question is going to be, because in this experiment, you also looked at the different personalities of the snakes. Some are bold, I think you, you use the words bold and shy, and right. that bold and shy uh, speaks to whether they want to go out and explore more than the shelters, or shy, they want to stay in the shelters. Um, what, what, uh, what creates this difference in personalities? So, so personalities in animals is a field that's been becoming increasingly popular over the last 25, 30 years. And um, we, we define personalities as differences between members of the same species that are consistent across time and across different contexts. And so what we actually did in this experiment is we um, also, in addition to putting the snakes in these groups, we also tested each snake individually. Uh, on two main measures of personality that are pretty standard in the animal literature. Boldness, which is usually measured by looking at how much time you spend exploring outside of a shelter. And we looked at how social you are. Um, and we measured how social they are by giving them the option of uh, going into one of two shelters on their own. Uh, and we made one shelter smell like other snakes and one shelter didn't. And we looked at how much time they spent in the shelter with the other snakes. Uh, and so personality is is a kind of important characteristic uh, of of animals, and it's more and more people are study are measuring the personalities of different individuals in a lot of experiments. Um, and what we did was connected their personalities to what we found in the group experiment. And so we find that your personality, uh, as established from being met, tested on your own actually predicts a lot of your behavior when you're in this group context. It predicts uh, what size of group you want to hang out with in a shelter, um, how much time you're going to spend outside the shelters, and things like that. Do you, do you know why? Sorry? Have lost um, the question. sorry? Do, you know no, why, do you know why the snakes uh, are drawn to be with a certain group and why they're not drawn to be with a certain group. I mean, you've, you've color coded their heads, but right. what, uh, what gets the snakes with the yellow dots in their heads to associate with 
other snakes with yellow dots in their heads, but not with pink dots in their heads. Oh, so it's it's nothing like that, right? I mean, we, we put dots on their heads randomly just so we can identify who's who. Oh, um, okay. And, and so they, they do have some individuals that they prefer to associate with and some individuals that don't. And that's why we, we say that the snakes have friends, um, although we're careful not to say that in the paper. But that's what, what all the popular press got out of it, that um, a, a friend is somebody that you prefer to interact with over somebody else. And so these why snakes do they have these preferences? Why do they yeah. have these preferences? So um, we don't know exactly. Um, there are a number of, of different possible reasons, um, some of which we intentionally controlled for. So we think that th they're probably not the issue. So for example, uh, it's known from the literature that snakes prefer to interact with other snakes that have a different diet from them. And this is because uh, snakes often compete over food and that competition can be very dangerous because they can't share food. They swallow their food whole, and so competition over food can be very dangerous for them. Um, but we made sure that all our snakes had the same diet, so there was no, th there shouldn't have been an issue there. Um, we do know that personality plays a role in this. That some snakes are very, very social and prefer to be with really large groups, and other snakes are less social and prefer to be with smaller groups. And there are interesting evolutionary questions about why that would happen what what is it that maintains these differences in personality within populations and there are, it, a, a, there are a bunch of tentative answers to that as well can you can you uh, just before i turn you over to rosie can you go into those tentative differences i mean what what causes these variabilities why are you a serious scientist and I'm not? I mean, is it something like luck? luck. <laughs> um, whose luck is the question? Um, so the I think the there are several ideas as to why you get a range of personalities in a group. One of them is that maybe what matters is not just the personality of the individual, but the composition of the group. So it's possible that in order to be really successful, you need a group that has a mix of different personalities in it. If you have a group where everybody's very bold, that group might disintegrate. If you have a group where everybody's very shy, they might never make a decision, for example. And so having a mix leads to groups that are more successful. Um, have you found this, this? Have you found this in your research? That there's a kind um, of a mix of personalities? Yeah, I tried to do this once with fish, but it's a it's a very difficult experiment to get right, and I've never really been able to to do it properly. Um, mm. The other suggestion is that it's possible that instead of there just being one way to be successful in the world, there are multiple ways to be successful, and so you can have different personalities, like say successful journalists and serious scientists, and both of those are valid strategies for doing well in the world. And what you then would expect to find, if that's true, is you would expect certain personality characteristics to cluster together. So if you've, if you've made one choice on your boldness, maybe you also need to make a certain choice on your sociability for that to hang together. Uh, and those kinds of things are called behavioral syndromes. And there's a lot of research that seems to suggest that you do find those things, that groups of personality characteristics cluster together. Uh, and probably, in my opinion, in these kinds of things, when you have multiple theories about what's driving something, usually the answer is some combination of all of these things. Do you know why it's only garter snakes that seem to have these sociability characteristics? Oh, um, it isn't. Um, so garter snakes are the only ones that we studied. Um, and this, the kind of studies that we've done haven't been done very much. There's a little bit uh, of work on some rattlesnakes. Uh, some vipers have parental care, and so they actually hang around in family groups. Uh, there's some work on rattlesnakes showing that they'll aggregate in dens. We've actually just replicated this entire experiment using ball pythons uh, instead of garter snakes. And we find, very interestingly, very similar results. And we're, we're not 
quite done with analyzing data. So I don't know exactly what happens there. But the reason this is interesting is, again, to go back to the ecology of these animals, garter snakes have a lot of good reasons to aggregate. They live you know, around here in Ontario, where it gets very cold and you need to hibernate, and it's good to hibernate with others. Um, garter snakes are one of only two species of snake in the world whose range extends beyond the Arctic Circle. So they have to deal with some pretty severe temperatures. Uh, ball pythons, on the, under, on the other hand, are from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they don't hunt in groups. They're kind of sit and wait predators. Um, and so there are much fewer reasons for them to be social. And the, the consensus is that they're not. They, again, only get together to mate. And we find that that's actually not true at all, at least in the lab. I don't know, maybe there are some things that we're doing in the lab that don't accurately mirror their environment uh, out in the wild. But in the lab, we find that they aggregate a lot like the garter snakes. And I would imagine if I had to guess that this would be true of many snakes with the possible exception of some species where adults prey on juveniles uh, like king snakes. But, but for most species of snakes, I would expect to find similar things to what okay. we found. Really? Rosie, I'm going to turn it over to you for a while. No, Gnome is yours. Oh, I, I can't hear you. No, she she has become muted. I muted myself. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so, so one of the things that I found hardest during the pandemic is the inability to hug my friends when I see them. And we know that humans get uh, kind of a hit of nice hormones when we physically interact with each other, like dopamine and oxytocin. And I was wondering if you know if the snakes get any sort of hormo nice hormonal response that um, kind of reinforces the need to interact physically with each other. Uh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I wish I had an answer for that. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I can say to pretend like I know, but no, I have no idea. It would be a great experiment to do. Um, it's not easy to draw blood from snakes, but it, you could potentially do it. Uh, I have no idea. Great question. I knew that was a, it was a bit of a tricky question because because you're not a physiologist. So <laughs> I have so I we, I have done uh, stuff like this before. Um, with with quail, we've done some some stuff looking at hormone changes when they interact with each other. Um, it's easier with quail because you can extract testosterone and cortisol levels from their poop, so you don't have to take their blood. But um, snakes poop, you know, once a week if you're lucky. So I don't I don't know. We haven't done anything like that. I'm trying to think whether I know of anybody else that's done something like that, uh, but I don't. I don't know that there may be okay. unlikely. Sorry, I failed on the very first question. Oh, no, that's, no, that's okay. Um, I think it's it's Joel's turn to ask the next question. It might be nice. Oh, it's, it's too bad. I, I feel like Rosie ought to follow up with with uh, with another one, but I'm I'm happy to ask one. Um, in your paper, you you describe the snakes as juveniles, and I was wondering if you could just tell us. Uh, this is part of a question. I was wondering if you could tell us. What a juvenile! What, what a juvenile is, and just to indicate where I'm going, one of your surprising findings to me was a lack of a of a of an effect of sex. It didn't seem that putting males and females together affected the structure of the group or the behavior you observed. I was surprised by that, and so I'm I'm wondering if you could tell us about juveniles and whether juveniles mate and that sort of thing. Yeah. Great question. Uh, so yes, all of the, the snakes in our experiment were juveniles, which just means um, snakes that are before sexual maturity. Um, and they hit sexual maturity. It, it varies, but uh, in the lab, they hit sexual maturity around eight or nine months of age. Uh, and what we find, as you say, is that there's no effect. So males don't prefer to interact with females and or vice versa. Um, and, and that is interesting. Males, uh, uh, snakes don't mate when they're juveniles. Um, garter snakes, at least, have a very kind of uh, regimented uh, sex life. So what happens is they're usually born uh, in the early spring 
kind of July, sorry, in the early summer, uh, in May or June, uh, and they'll, you know, grow and then they go into hibernate when it gets cold. So around here, they would probably go into hibernate in early October, late September. And when they come out of hibernation is when they mate, right after they come out of hibernation in, in April or May. Uh, and then their gestation is a couple of months. So they only mate when they come out of hibernation. Um, there's actually a theory that uh, males actually won't produce sperm unless they hibernate. So in our lab, they don't hibernate. They're, they're kept under constant temperatures all year. Uh, and so as far as we know, they won't mate under these conditions. One of the interesting things is that we were actually very interested in this developmental question as well about whether these things change as they age. So we've now repeated this experiment. Uh, we took another group of snakes and we ran them through this social group experiment uh, every two months. The same snakes went through this thing every two months uh, from when they were about two months old until they were about a year and a half old. So we repeated this over and over again. And what we find is exactly, I think, what you were hinting at, that as they age and as they hit sexual maturity, the dynamics of the behavior change a lot. And what we can show is that the males start preferring to interact with females. The females have fewer preferences. And this is something that you find in a lot of species. Um, and what we can also show, other than, in, in addition to just looking at the interactions between two snakes, we can quantify which snake initiates each interaction. So am I going to, to, to interact with you or are you coming to interact with me? And what we show is that when they're young, it's pretty much even. The males and the females both initiate interactions. And as they get older, the males start driving all of the interactions. So it's males chasing females around. Uh, and, and so that does change. When, when you when say, we, sorry, when you say the females have fewer preferences, what do you mean? Sorry, I meant le less distinct preferences. The females don't care whether they interact with males or females as okay. much. And this is something sorry, you find ahead, across a bunch of different species. The, the very last uh, thing I was wondering about this part of it is when I Googled garter snake reproduction, because I had no idea how they how they uh, reproduced, what came up was a photo of a group of snakes. Is that yeah. do they reproduce in groups? And, and is the group that I saw in that photo like the groups that you're seeing in your assay? Right. So so garter snakes. So the pictures that you saw online uh, are of what's called a mating ball. And those are red sided garter snakes. Um, primarily in Manitoba, you get these huge mating balls of thousands of snakes together as soon as they come out of hibernation. Um, oh, those are some of our snakes and you can see the markings on their heads. Um, so Eastern garter snakes, which are what we worked with, don't really form these large mating balls, nothing like the red-sided garter snakes out west, but um, they do mate in larger groups. Um, and in fact, there's a really interesting thing that they do. So one of the things that is most important as a snake is heat, uh, because snakes can't generate heat, they have to draw it from the environment. And sitting around on a rock while you're cold and heating up can be very dangerous because you're cold, so you can't move very fast, and you're exposed because you wanna be in the sunlight. So that's very dangerous. And one alternative to that is to just steal heat from somebody else that's already warmed up. You can just snuggle up to them uh, and steal their heat. And this happens a lot in garter snakes. And during mating is a particularly good time to do that because there's all these males that have spent a lot of time warming up so that they'll be fast and get to the female first. And so there are actually, there are actually three sexes in garter snakes. Um, there's males, females, and there's what's called she-males. And the she-males are males that give off female pheromones so that other males are attracted to them and try to mate with them. And while they do that, they steal their heat. Um, so they do mate in groups, uh, smaller than the red-sided garter snakes that you would have seen online, but, but still in groups. And again, it's, it happens, you know, there's maybe two, three weeks uh, when all the mating happens, which is right after they come out of hibernation. What, what circumstances lead to a she-male? Good question. I don't know. It's a, ask Rosie. It's probably hormones. 
<laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I actually don't know anything about hormones. <laughs> oh. Um, I have a, I have a question that's a bit of a follow up to what Joel was talking about earlier with the the ages. Um, in your experiment, the each of each of the groups uh, or each of the the batches were from the same cohort, so they were the same age. Um, but I was wondering, in the wild, would you find uh, snakes from different cohorts, so of different ages, hanging out with each other, or would you risk, say? an older snake eating a smaller snake because it's a good opportunity for a snack. Yeah. Um, so again, we don't know a lot about garter snake assemblages, unfortunately. Um, they are, because they're, again, because they tend to be, they all mate at about the same time. They are, the, the structure of the population is very kind of, there's eight distinct age groups. Um, there, as far as I know, there's no cannibalism in Eastern garter snakes. Um, although there is in some other snakes, but I, I don't actually know whether they would hang together with individuals from other ages. Uh, it's a it's a good question. Hmm. I have many fewer answers than I should. It's exciting. That means there's lots to lots for you to find out. So that's yes. That's, it means you're in an exciting field. Why has this caused so much excitement in the? Um, I don't know what you call it, the scientific press. Yeah, uh, I, I wish why? I knew. Um, and, and I wish I knew because if I knew, I might be able to replicate the, the effect. Um, I think partly it's because there's not a lot of research out there on snake behavior. Um, I think partly it's because there was a, a kind of a nice, clean, one-line explanation of the paper, snakes have friends. Um, you know, whether that's accurate or not. Um, I think, I, I mean, a lot of the the articles kind of made fun of this issue of social distancing. They're like, oh, you'd think snakes would be really good at social distancing, and then it turns out they're not. So maybe we were just, you know, at the right time because coronavirus was becoming more serious when this paper came out. I, I have no idea. I think it's probably mostly the first one, the, the fact that mm. good news stories about snakes, you know, it's not like an anaconda ate my puppy. It's a good thing about snakes. I think there's not a lot of those. You were telling me when we talked about this earlier in the week that it's it's had a kind of a positive effect on students wanting to get into your lab. Uh, yeah, well, suddenly, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of snake labs around, um, certainly in, in this area. Uh, people who do snake behavior or snake cognition there's there's very few i i know of four or five in the world um and so anybody who really loves snakes and and snakes are one of these things that most people either hate or are obsessed with and so uh, all of the potential graduate students who are obsessed with snakes have been emailing me to ask if they can join the lab so that's that's great it helps me attract good quality graduate students right right can, can I follow up with a social distancing question? <laughs> um, one of the things, I, I might need your help uh, explaining this, but one, one of the results you reported was that um, the snakes like to go out of the shelters as individuals more than they like to go out as groups. But I, that's what I understood the paper to be saying. But but. That wasn't quite well. So go ahead, please t tell me exactly what you were saying there. Right. So sorry. So what we were saying is that actually the snakes like to go out of the shelters together. Um, so when they're so they like to shelter in the shelters together in groups, and they also like to explore the environment outside together. And what's interesting about that? So initially, when we as a little insight into how these things go for, for people. Um, initially, when we wrote this, one of the reviewers wrote back, well, it's possible that just when one snake leaves the shelter, that's a disturbance, and that causes others to leave that same shelter. And so we actually did a follow-up analysis of this and showed that when one snake left the shelter and started exploring, other snakes came out from other shelters, not necessarily from that same shelter. 
Uh, so they often will kind of poke their heads out of the shelter and just peek out to see what's going on. And we think that they can see that another snake is out and then that makes them more likely to also go out and explore themselves. So is it possible that the the snakes that are going out, this was the question I was driving at, is it possible that the snakes going out are actually interacting but at a different social distance, that they maintain that awareness of each other being outside and that they're sort of in different lanes but aware of each other and in some sense g garnering, if you will, the, the protection from others? Yeah, it's it's definitely possible. Um, it's a little hard to say because our arena is relatively small. So even if they wanted to get far from each other, they really couldn't. Um, and it's also, I think, important to note that um, snakes, so we, we're a very visual species. And we think of, you know, if I'm out hanging with hanging around with somebody outside, I can see that other person. And that's how I know where they are and what's going on. Um, with snakes, it's much more about olfaction, about smell. And as they slither through the world, they leave these scent trails behind them on the surface. And they're really, really good at, at reading these scent trails. And they can extract a lot of information from them. We know that they can tell from a scent trail uh, the sex of the individual that created it, the age group of the individual that created it, possibly whether or not they're related to that individual um, and the species, uh, of course. And so it's possible, and, and they can probably tell how long ago it was laid down. And so it's possible that when they're moving around, you know, it's like we, we talk about dogs kind of reading their environment as they're moving through it. Snakes are doing the same thing. As they're moving through the environment, they have a kind of a whole history of who's been here recently. And so I don't know if they're actually looking at each other while they're out together uh, or whether it's more somehow mediated by odor. We did try to, we clean the arena a couple times a day um, in, in this experiment to try and control for those odors a little bit. Um, but definitely I think within the size of our arena, being outside together as a group will definitely give you some of those benefits of, of being in a group. So if a predator comes by and he's only gonna eat one snake, if there are five of you out exploring at the same time, then you only have a 20% chance of being the one that gets eaten. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're out on your own and a predator comes by, there's a 100% chance that you're dead. Yeah, okay, thanks. Rosie, I think that's your cue. Okay, Maybe the well, I have one more question, um, or another question, uh, which is how uh, how does re being related to the other snakes come into this, and and do they tend to associate with? Are these aggregations usually made out of closely related in individuals, and, and then you, I guess, you would have a lot of inbreeding going on. But maybe you're also more likely to be uh, friendly towards your kin um, because. Uh, if things are good for you, it's good for your kin and they share the same genes. And so there's a kind of genetic uh, bonus of, of being nice to your, being nice to your family. Yeah. So um, yet again, I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> um, we, we did in our, in our experiment, all of the groups were snakes that were related to each other. Um, we, we are actually now, right now, we're doing the same kind of experiment where we put the snakes into groups and we're shuffling the groups around to try and see what kinds of effects that has. We had one case in our experiment where we had two different families in, in the same group of the experiment and we didn't find that they were more likely to hang out with individuals they were related to, but that's, that's one data point. So I don't wanna conclude anything from that. Uh, it is a really interesting question. Um, garter snakes tend to lay a whole bunch of, they, they give birth to live young, they don't lay eggs, but they tend to give birth all at once. So you would, as a, as a young snake, you would kind of find yourself in the same place as all your siblings. But as you noted, at some point, you're gonna wanna disperse away from that location so that you don't breed with your siblings. Um, and we don't know how that happens. Uh, nobody knows anything about garter snake dispersal. So maybe, <laughs> I, I don't know. 
Oh, beautiful. Uh, there's a question from Kathleen Powell, uh, a Massey Hi, alumna, alumna, and a doctor of law from all the way from Cape Town. And she asks, is personality reducible to a question of evolution? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, part of it certainly has to do with, with evolution. There's nothing in snakes, but in a lot of other species, we do know that there are genetic effects on personality, uh, including in humans, right? So if you as a human take a personality test, your results are likely to be more similar to those of your parents than they are to some randomly selected person. Um, so some of it is genetic, but some of it might also be experience based. So if, if, you know, if I've had a bunch of particular experiences in my life, that's definitely going to shape some of my personality. Uh, and the balance between how much of it is genetic and how much of it is experience based in animals uh, I don't know, and I don't think anybody does. Has there been attempts to measure that, Noam? A, a the, little the bit in, in fish. Huh. And oh. we have, can you, can you put Natalie's question up again, uh, Matt? I, I, uh, I only got part of it. There we go. What is the future of research of gamer snakes and what's next in your research? So I think there's, as, as my kind of failure to answer so many of the questions I think has shown, there's a ton that we don't know about these snakes' behavior and their cognition. Uh, and I think that that's a really interesting thing to, to answer, to find out. Uh, so there are a lot of different questions uh, about what they do socially and what they do in other aspects of their cognition that we have no idea what the answers to are. Um, what we are doing is, um, as, I, as I mentioned, we're replicating these experiments under different conditions to see whether, for example, you tend to hang out with individuals that you're related to, um, to look at how these things change as you age. Um, one of our interesting questions is, so we find that some snakes are more social and some snakes are less social. And the question is, if you're more social, are you a very social individual in whatever network you happen to find yourself? Or is it specific to the network that you're in? And so in the experiment that, that we're talking about here, each snake was only in one group. What we're now doing is repeating these experiments over and over again, shuffling the groups so that each snake gets to be in a bunch of different networks with different individuals. And we wanna see, you know, if you're the most social snake in your first network, does that mean that you're likely to be the most social snake in your next network? Uh, what happens if we put all the really social snakes together? Uh, so we're, we're doing a, a bunch of things like that. And we're also interested in expanding this question to other species. As, as I said in the beginning, I'm very interested in the comparative aspects of this. So we've done this now with ball pythons. Um, next year, we're hoping to do this with um, hognose snakes. Uh, we're also an, an Ontario snake uh, that have, again, a, an interesting different ecology that might alter how their social behavior works. And I hope that putting together all of these pieces from different species will let us get at some of the fundamental rules of, of what's happening, right? I mean, if you think of sociologists, you know, the early sociologists going out and studying a bunch of different cultures to try and figure out what are the fundamental building blocks of a culture, we're trying to do the same thing for social behavior in animals. Would would snakes uh, try and you, you'll forgive me for how I'm going to phrase this, but would snakes try to answer for themselves uh, whether it's a good idea to have X number of bold individuals in the group and X Y number of, of shy individuals and and so put themselves together that way? So they might. So one thing that you could do is go out into the wild and try to look at naturally occurring groups of snakes and look at the distribution of personalities within naturally occurring groups. 
um, just like, again, psychologists, kind of social psychologists have done this with humans. You can look at the range of personalities that you tend to find in a group of friends. Um, nobody's ever done this yet. Um, we tried. We put out a bunch of shelters that we hoped would attract a lot of snakes that we could then study, and none of them came to our shelters in our field site. So that didn't work. Um, I, I tried to do this once with fish, put a bunch of fish in and let them self-assort into groups. Um, and it didn't work because the groups were very fluid. Individuals kept switching between groups. And I think the same thing happens with snakes. People sometimes refer to these as fish and fusion groups where your membership in a group isn't actually fixed. It changes on relatively short timescales. Uh, and if you think about it, humans do the same kinds of things, right? We, we have our, our work friends, and then we have other friends, and then we have our family, and we, we move in all these different circles. So which one of those do you break out and say, this is your actual group? Hmm. So, I don't, so yeah, again, the short answer is I don't know the answer to your question. You, you did differentiate. You had two different groups brought together, wild caught and captive. Was there any differences in their behavior? So that's a great question. It's again, hard to tell because one entire group in the experiment were the captive ones and they were also the oldest ones when we tested them. So we don't know about that. The reason that we brought together these multiple groups is just because of our ability to acquire snakes, which was relatively limited. Um, we, we captured in the, from the wild uh, as many snakes as we could uh, under our, our permit, our, our collecting permit. And then we, we wanted more snakes than that, so we bought some from a breeder. But um, th that wasn't something we did intentionally. Are you, are, you limited by, are, you, are you limited by law to how many snakes you can capture? So uh, we're, we're limited by law on the one hand. If you, without a permit, you're not allowed to capture any snakes. Um, we really? have a, yes, you can't just go out and catch snakes in the wild and take them home. Um, we have something called a scientific collector's permit from the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, which specifies how many snakes we could collect. To be honest, we didn't reach the limit that the ministry gave us because we weren't able to find enough snakes. Uh, again, they're very hard to find. Um, so we weren't able to, to find enough. Uh, and we've now mostly moved to just buying snakes from breeders, which is a lot easier because you don't have to go tramping around natural national parks trying to find snakes. Are you are you limited to dragonflies, Rosie, to capturing dragonflies? Um, so things are a little bit simpler when you work with something without a spine. Um, usually, so anything that is an invertebrate, you don't need as much. Um, animal care protocol um, because their cognitive functions as we understand them are much uh, simpler. Um, so you don't have to go as through quite as much vigorous ethics protocol as you would um, with something that has a, that is a vertebrate. Um, so I, if I was working with a either an invasive species or an endangered species, then I might need some protocol um, in terms of handling or collecting. But by and large, I don't work with any um, endangered species. Um, and most most of the dragonfly species that we have here are doing OK. Um, uh, and and I, I tend to work with the more abundant species because they're a lot easier to collect. Hmm. No, Peter Martin asks, as a musician, have you tried to see if your snakes ah, respond to music? Seriously, do snakes even communicate? And I lost the rest of the question. But seriously, do snakes even communicate with sound as part of their social interactions? Right. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, you remember the all the things that they... Of the cobras uh, with people playing pipes to them, yeah. Right, which which there's a, there's a bit of a debate about whether the cobras are actually reacting to the sound. These are very well-trained snakes and they just know what they have to do. The sound is more to amuse the onlookers. Um, but um, 
So on the one hand, snakes, as far as we know, don't have any mechanisms for producing sounds. Um, you know, there's this hissing that happens when they when they flick their tongues out, but they don't they don't make sounds. They don't have vocal cords. Um, and yet, on the other hand, they are amazingly well equipped to detect sounds because they have their entire body pressed up against the ground. And so anytime the ground vibrates, they can really feel that quite well. Um, they do have ears, although their ears are entirely internal. There's no, on some species of snake, you can see a kind of little opening where the ear is. On garter snakes, they don't even have that. Um, so we don't know. I don't think that they communicate with sound at all. I think they can probably feel the vibrations of things happening. Certainly they can feel the vibrations of, of humans as we're walking around and move out of the way, as Kipling pointed out. Um, but I don't know if they can hear other snakes moving around. And I don't think they communicate using sounds intentionally. I have, I, I just thought of another kind of silly question. Um, well, we'll see if it's silly or not. But um, so if we, if we know that snakes kind of make, have friends or preferred associations uh, with each other, do snakes have enemies as in, snakes that they negatively associate with. So if blue dot comes in, red dot always leaves. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, we found one snake in, not in, in this experiment, but in some of the follow-up stuff, we found one snake that was just antisocial. And so if it was sitting in a shelter and anybody came in, it would leave. Um, so that happened once, we don't know why, that snake was antisocial. Um, it may have had to do with its its age or its weight. We, we have no idea, and it only happened once. By and large, most of the snakes are relatively social. And what we find that's interesting, as, as I mentioned, we've started repeating this uh, over and over as the snakes age. And what we find is that when they're very young, up to about five, six months, they don't really care who they associate with. They They kind of associate promiscuously with anybody. And as they age, they start to form these preferred uh, preferred associations with some other individuals. So it's possible that they could kind of form enmities with certain specific other individuals. I, I've never observed it, but but who knows? Did this did this did this grumpy uh, snake change at all? Did did she or he start forming friendships uh no but you know over the course of the time that we examined him he didn't but yeah. who knows they definitely change right we know that as they age they change in their social behaviors we're actually now doing um i have a student now who is doing these personality tests on individual snakes uh, again, same deal, taking these personality tests and doing them over and over every couple of months as the snakes age to see how that develops over the lifetime. And and but you're starting if, on the basis of bold and, and shy? Uh, yeah, we're doing what? exactly the same tests of boldness and shyness, but every snake goes through these tests every two months. So we started when they were two months old. They've just had their four-month-old tests, and we're going to keep going for another year or so. Has the genome been described? No. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a complete genome for any snake species. Uh, that There might be, but not that I'm aware of. Uh, but no, we, we don't know very much about their genomes. And they're, they're very weird. I mean, snakes have... So the number of snakes that you find born with weird mutations is kind of an order of magnitude larger than what you would find in most other species. Um, you get uh, two-headed snakes are relatively common. Uh, there are massive variations in color morphs on, on the skin um, that seem to be, they're definitely genetic, but they're weirdly genetic. So they don't breed true. They're, they're all over the place. Um, there are kind of gross morphological differences. You get you know, snakes will, every now and then a snake will be born with kind of a vestigial limb, like a little part of a leg trailing off the back of them. Um, so they seem to be really weird genetically. 
they don't they don't um, regulate their genome in the way that you would expect a modern self-respecting species to do. Um, but um, I, I I don't know why. The, there's I can't think of any uh, complete genome of a snake species. If there is, it would be something venomous where they care about the molecules that are going into the venom. Yeah, there's there's people in neuroscience use snake venom uh, for for a variety of reasons. And in your case, I was wondering about histocompatibility because there there are you know what I'm asking. So go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't. Histocompatibility okay. is what? So, yeah. so one of the ways that human beings avoid incest is by being able to smell whether or not you're related to somebody. And, and what we smell are molecules of this thing called the major histocompatibility complex, which, which I think is what Joel was referring to. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the, I think the question, I guess, is do snakes do this? Do they avoid breeding with other individuals that they're related to using that? I don't know. Nobody's ever studied that. I would guess that they do. Um, snakes are really, they have incredibly sensitive olfactory systems. They have a whole second olfactory system, right, in addition to the one that we have. Um, so they have two whole separate senses of smell. Um, they can detect very low concentrations of things, um, and they can detect a wide range of things. So I would, and, and just like any other species, avoiding inbreeding, avoiding breeding with others that you're related to is very important to them. So I would imagine that they have some sort of olfactory mechanism for doing that, but I don't know uh, anything about that. There is one guy, um, there's a guy in, uh, in Buffalo who's done some works on garter snake mating. Um, he would know. I forget his name right now. Randy something. Hmm. Yeah, mate choice. So we come under mate choice. Yeah. Yeah. So when they're sniffing at the shelters, that is possibly what they could be doing is checking to see if there's kin. Um, maybe. I think so. I think that there are different modes. Again, if, if you're a snake, the time when you're mating is a very limited, it's it's two or three weeks of the year when you're in mate mating mode. Um, the rest of the time you're you're not necessarily mating, so you maybe don't care so much excuse me, whether or not you're hanging out with kin or not. Um, what they're doing in the shelters, we think, is actually they actually kind of stick their heads into the shelter. And we think what they're doing is looking at how many other individuals are in here, or possibly how much space is there in here. Snakes like really tight spaces where they can just about fit and, and nothing else is going to fit in there to, to attack them. And so... I think what they do is they look in the shelter and they go, oh, this is pretty snug because there's a lot of other individuals taking up the space already. This, this would be great. Mm -hmm. Folks, we've got two minutes left. Uh, Rosie or Joel, do you have a final question for Noam to take away with them? No? Nope. I mean, I can, I can go if Joel doesn't mind. Sure. Um, I guess this is a closing question is, um, what else, do you have any other research going on in your lab other than your garter snake research that you're really excited about? Um, wow, okay, that's not a two minute question. Um, no. So <laughs> I'm, um, I'm excited about all my research, um, but I don't uh, know if all of it is exciting to other people. Um, I'm really interested in social behavior and social cognition wherever it appears. So I have currently in my lab, we have two different species of snakes. We have three different species of fish uh, in my lab, one of which is blind and has evolved away its eyes. Um, we have some quail in the lab and we're asking all kinds of questions about social networks and social behavior in all of these species um, to again, hopefully get a kind of broader picture of what are the building blocks of social structures that are common to all social structures. That that feels like a summary. That's pretty awesome. good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Yes. Are you? Did you want to add a a farewell? 
Oh no, I no no, I was just no. agreeing with Noam and okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much to the three of you. Thank you, especially Noam. You have thank talked you. well. And uh, yeah. I hope our audience has enjoyed this as much as I have. And so that's it. We're done. Goodbye. Bye. Happy thank you. you.